Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 29th of, of May, um, and uh, we have a wonderful group of people here with us. Steve Zemelman is still trying to get in here, but uh, we hope he does. Um, and um, Jesse, uh, say your last name for me. It's Hagopian. Jesse Hagopian. Hagopian. I would have not have gotten that right, so thank you for pronouncing that for us. Jesse um, looks like uh, he may have to leave uh, first here, so we're going to um, let Jesse talk first as we go. Patrick Delaney has joined us as well just now, and uh, Di Diana Laufenberg is with us, and Jose Wilson. Um, and our topic tonight is teachers speaking up. And, and I think we have lots of different examples of teachers speaking up here. Patrick, do you want to check in, see if your, your sound is working? Patrick Delaney, did you know we you were going to talk here? <laughs> no, we don't hear you yet. Okay, you'll work on that. Now, Diana, could you jump us in and and, and <laughs> introduce yourself, and then we'll just go across quick introductions. Sure, Diana Laufenberg. Um, I was 15 years in the classroom, and this year working doing a lot of consulting, working with the schools around the country, and most recently I'm working on New Schools Project um, with Chris Lehman in Philadelphia and a Turnaround School Project in Philadelphia as well. Wow. So you are still working in Philadelphia with Chris Lehman. Okay. Intermittently. Okay. A New Schools Project? SLA is spinning off? Okay. We, have a new S we have a new... Yes, we did just hear that. Um, yes, Patrick. You know, there's going to be a new SLA opening at a new campus, so an additional 500 students. Um, wow will be on a second campus starting in the fall. Wow, that's pretty exciting. It is. Cool. Jesse, introduce yourself and say your last name one more time and we'll get it straight this time. Yeah, I'm Jesse Hagopian. I teach at Garfield High School, the site of the historic map test boycott this year <laughs> and also Jimi Hendrix's alma mater. Um, and cool. I am a, an associate editor at Rethinking Schools I'm a founding member of the Social Equality Educators, and my family and I survived the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. We were there on my wife's um, public health work, and coming back, um, I joined the board of Mahalilu. It's a Haiti solidarity organization in Seattle, so that's some of the work that I've been doing. Now, and say what you're going to release tomorrow. Well, well I'm uh, launching my website. It's uh, IamanEducator.com. Mm -hmm. You can uh, go look at it, but um, I'll have my first post that I'll send out tomorrow and uh, compile a lot of the work around um, quality assessment and the struggle against high-stakes testing that I've been doing uh, on that website and other writings that I've done on and uh, talks I've given. Cool. If, if it isn't clear yet, uh, I think I did say right at the beginning, but um, what we have here are, are examples of teachers who do speak up. Um, and certainly, Jesse, you've um, been leading a protest there at Garfield, um, so we'll get a chance to hear your story. Jose, uh, Wilson, thank you for joining us. Um, you're a, certainly a teacher, when we think of teachers speaking up, who speaks up and says his, his uh, mind. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Um, see, because intros aren't my thing, but um, Jose Wilson, math teacher, and I tend to be pithy with these things. So I teach math, and I write a lot. So, hi. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought after Jesse's really complete resume there, you would, no, thank you. That, that was very good. Patrick, can you talk yet? We were able to hear you. Try again. Okay. Um, we don't hear you yet. Patrick Delaney is a big union guy in uh, San Francisco. And he is why I do blogging. So um, as Bud Hunt once called uh, Patrick Delaney, he is the godfather of blogging in the, uh, in the National Writing Project. And it is so, working. There you go. It is working now, yes. Hey, hey, hey. So you, 
I was butchering your introduction, so introduce yourself, Patrick. Uh, so, d real brief, I'm, I'm, a, Patrick, I'm a, a librarian at Galileo Academy in San Francisco, spent many years with the writing project, and now I am, um, well, some people refer to me as retired, but I see myself as being forced into um, a, a pensioned <laughs> withdrawal. And, and you have been representing the union at your school for a number of years as well, yes? Yeah, actually, that's I just got kicked out for that. Okay. Cool. Um, Steve, can you can you hear and and talk? I can hear. Can you hear me? We can hear. So that's fine. Go ahead. I, but you can't see me. We can't see you. But that's I don't okay. know why that is. Uh, I don't know. My either. camera's on. But. You're a very handsome man, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. That's what I am. Well, <laughs> so introduce yourself, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Zemmelman. I'm director of the Illinois Writing Project. Um, I am a not. I don't have a regular job at this point. I don't need one, fortunately, and uh, but I am still um, working a lot writing and speaking in schools and I have this newer project called Teachers Speak Up uh, with website teacherspeakup.com it's almost a year now that I I guess I've lost track that I've been doing that uh, to try to get help teachers to have more of a voice in the public discussion uh, on education policy um, and especially to help those who would be really hesitant to speak because they fear that they would lose their job and they are not in a position to for to let that happen right now and um, uh, we can cool. we'll talk more about it as we go I guess sounds good um see you might check up under settings there might I be did. Just, no, you did I don't did. worry looks yeah. like it, uh, so, so as long as we can hear you, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, Good. sorry. Mary Beth, very quick introduction. Hello? Hi. Can everybody hear me? Perfect. Oh. Surprising. Uh, I'm Mary Beth Whitehouse. I'm a New York City teacher. Um, I guess we're kind of summarizing our leadership positions currently. There you go. So I'm yeah. just a, uh, I mean, I'm just a classroom teacher, like 100,000 other classroom teachers in New York City. Um, I think I was invited because I've made a little bit of a splash after uh, I was listed as a highly effective teacher and started a campaign against such nonsense as classifying us as highly effective um, in comparison to my colleagues using student test scores and I just thought that was an asinine thing to do uh, in our profession and I've started several blogs, none of which list me as myself. I operate under pseudonyms and oh, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Several. <laughs> Several, yeah. <Okay. laughs> really interesting. Okay. But um we so, so and sorry if we need to do this, but Jesse, let's give you the spotlight first since you may have to leave. Um, with some family there. Can you tell us the story of what happened in January and uh, what's happened here in March um, up there in Garfield? I think it was January, right? That's right. Well, uh, yeah, and thanks so much for the invitation to come on. I'm sorry I'll have to leave early because it sounds like we have a lot of good fighters on this panel and I would uh, really like to hear all of your stories, so I'll have to go back and look at the link when we're done and hear uh, about resistance all over the country. And just to say, we are continuing this conversation on June 18th as well, but go ahead. Yep. All right. So uh, the immediate story starts in January when um, we organized a boycott at Garfield High School of the Measures of Academic Progress Test, or the MAP test. Uh, this is a computer-generated uh, um, test and the students go to the computer labs and the library and uh, they're asked to take a test in math and reading to show uh, their proficiency in those subjects and I got a call one afternoon by a teacher who said can you come to my classroom I have something I need to tell you and I'm the union rep at my school and so I'm used to getting 
uh, calls about contractual issues and different disputes and needing to come and sort it out. And I assumed that was what her uh, issue was. And so I went to her classroom after school, and it was apparent right away to me that this was something a little heavier because she was looking around, <laughs> closed the door, sat me down, and she said, I'm not going to give the MAP test this year. And my eyes lit up because I'd been working on this issue for some time. I got a resolution. Um, I helped to get a resolution passed in my union uh, two years ago uh, saying this, this test uh, was not an effective measure uh, of uh, teachers. Uh, and so when I heard this, I, I was overjoyed. But we have many examples through, uh, throughout the country and even in Seattle of teachers who individually refused to give tests and were quickly um, disciplined, suspended, or fired. And so uh, we began brainstorming immediately, how can we try to get more and more teachers on board? So we held meetings in my classroom. Had um, that, could I just say, had that teacher um, announced that anywhere else yet? Or at this point, it was just you and, and that teacher? Uh, She'd had informal conversations with different people uh, about how bad this test was and that she didn't want to give it. And um, she uh, had begun the conversation already. But she wanted to begin a serious organizing campaign. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, began holding meetings in, our, in my classroom the language arts department um, and her and the testing coordinator were actually some of the first people to come on board uh, and want to resist this test and they began meeting with the math department as well and it became clear that we had widespread sentiment against this test the people cited many many faults with the map test it is not aligned to our curriculum so our ninth grade algebra teachers uh, told us that they're seeing geometry questions on the test so that's similar to if you're a Spanish teacher and you see a French question on your test okay yeah it's foreign language <laughs> but it, it's a different subject and uh, you know Everything from the, uh, English language learners having to take this test the most and special education students being pulled out of class the most to take a test, uh, missing valuable class time. And when it became clear that we had the majority of teachers in the tested subjects, we decided that we wanted to actually take this to the entire staff and see if we could get Garfield to speak with one voice against this test and so we called an all staff meeting and we had most of the staff there um, some 90 different educators and uh, we weighed the pros and cons of saying we're not going to give it and it was a thorough debate and it was uh, very uh, well considered and well reasoned decision we came to it was a lot of teachers knew this test was wrong but were afraid of the consequences and they asked me what could happen if I refused to give this test and I didn't sugarcoat it I told them you know we have a progressive discipline policy in Seattle but ultimately you could be fired uh, you could be severely reprimand letters put in your file um, for refusing uh, a directive and uh, insubordination and Finally, one teacher rose and she said, you know what, this test is labeling me and my students failures and I'd rather be reprimanded for standing up for what I believe in than letting this test run over uh, our education system. And I said, okay, it's time for a vote now. And it was unanimous, save a couple of abstentions. And we called a press conference soon after. And uh, all the media showed up, it went national, and it just became a, a really intense. Uh, it's been a crazy year. My life has been in chaos ever since. Um, there's been media requests from all over the country, thousands of parents and teachers sending us emails, 
sending us uh, letters. Uh, we get books in the mail on a regular basis from education authors. Um, but, you know, that was an inspiring uh, to see all these people support us, but the superintendent quickly sent us an email saying, this test is not optional, you will give it, and uh, we expect all the employees in Seattle to follow procedure. And I know at that moment when that email flashed across the screen of all the teachers at Garfield High School, people's hearts skipped a beat and wondered, had we really made the right decision? Could we, could we follow through with this um, back in, in uh, January? And, you know, it was only minutes after that that the bell rang and it was time for lunch and the office staff came on the, the intercom and said a school in Florida had sent us pizza uh, in solidarity with our struggle and we should all meet in the teachers lounge for lunch and it was there that we all realized okay we've really touched a nerve across the country of teachers who are tired of being labeled as test scores and the intellectual process of teaching and learning being reduced to meaningless data points and <clears throat> we uh, just continued our movement through the threats and really one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen in my life is teachers losing their fear it, it was an electric feeling at Garfield when the superintendent threatened us with a 10-day suspension without pay and teachers uh, instead of being scared and backing down said you know what if he's gonna fire me for doing what's best for my students then I'm working in the wrong district bring it on basically and um, I think that really taught me a lot and it taught me that educators should be the ones that are listened to around what is best for our education system and it, this is what's really terrifying the corporate education reformers this boycott represents a serious threat to their entire project of uh, labeling us test scores and then using that data to uh, close schools like you're seeing done in Chicago and Philadelphia um, and to privatize education through charter schools um, and I think that you know the reason why Michelle Ree uh, wrote an op-ed to the Seattle Times telling us to stop the boycott is because this is a crisis for their ability to uh, push through these corporate education reforms and I think it represents uh, a new moment in education where people around the country uh, have taken up our challenge and we saw students in Oakland walk out uh, our students in Portland walk out against the Oaks test and students in Chicago walk out against standardized testing we saw 10,000 people in Texas uh, march and over and over again um, I think we're seeing this movement just continue uh, to grow and you know Arne Duncan has said that education is the civil rights movement of our time and that he called waiting for Superman the teacher bashing privatization championing uh, anti-union film he called that the Rosa Parks moment of our era and uh, as, a, as a teacher of history I have to say I think that the map test boycott at Garfield High School is much more close to a Rosa Parks moment I think that we're uh, if if I remember right Rosa Parks uh, launched a boycott and that boycott spread uh, the civil rights movement around the nation and I hope the same thing uh, happens uh, with with our struggle in Seattle and we recently just got word um, from the superintendent that in fact uh, the map test will no longer be required at the high school level and it's a huge victory and vindication of our of our movement um, but the struggle continues because he is mandating it at the K-8 level and there's uh, uh, still two schools at the K-8 level in Seattle who are boycotting the test 
and we're going to do everything we can to build support for them uh, going into next year to make sure they don't get reprimanded and to once and for all scrap the map. So thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you told a, a long story there. Uh, Can I you, ask a question? Yes, please. And do you, do you have uh, a few more minutes to field a few questions, Justin? Yeah, I'll take a couple questions before Thanks. I go. Good. Is yeah. that Steve? Go ahead. Yeah, it is. This, this is Steve, and I better identify myself yeah. when I speak since you can't see me talking. Um, uh, I, I'm especially interested in the turning points uh, at which the teachers lost their fear. Um, and, uh, of course, a big one, I mean, once that one teacher stood up and said, you know, I'd rather lose my job than be labeled a failure, it's sort of, you know, I can understand that one because it's like, okay, we don't have that much left to lose. But until that point, a lot of teachers might have feared what was coming. So I, I'd like to hear from Jesse what you think helped uh, them take that first step um, because I think that's so hard for so many teachers and uh, you know they it's it's kind of the fear of the unknown and uh, somehow you guys overcame that so I wonder what you think are the differences in your situation that helped that because I think that's really crucial to understand no that's a great question and I think one of the things that help teachers at Garfield know that this map test boycott would be well organized and that we would uh, have a clear message and that we could work together as one um, is because this isn't the first thing that we've done as a faculty uh, uh, um, or political action that's occurred at Garfield High School and I've taken the last couple years as the union rep to really try to politicize uh, union meetings on a monthly basis and discuss uh, education policy and um, get input from our staff and what they think and hold discussions so that the last couple years our union meetings have been a place where we can really debate through what is quality assessment, um, good education practices and what do we think should be done. And then last year um, I am part of a group called Social Equality Educators and the state legislature announced that they would cut two billion dollars from um, education and health care uh, and I went down to the Capitol to stage a citizen's arrest of the state legislature mm -hmm. because it actually violates our state constitution which calls education the paramount duty of our state and then a court had ruled that we were already in violation of the constitution before that two billion so a bunch of us went down there uh, we read out our charges against the state legislature when they started their meeting and um, then I dangled plastic handcuffs and encouraged them to turn themselves in. Uh, <laughs> I was arrested in the course of that um, and spent the evening in jail and my students at Garfield found out that I was arrested and they formed a Facebook page called Free Mr. Hagopian. And uh, when I came out to school the next day, um, they figured, well, I guess the campaign worked. Here he is. Uh, what else can we do? So they changed the Facebook page to walk out against the budget cuts. And in one day, they organized a mass walkout of Garfield High School. And they marched to the mayor's office and demanded that education be funded. And they got their picture in the New York Times. They were all over the Seattle media. And they formed a citywide coalition. And I think the teachers were really inspired by the actions that the students, oh, um, you know, standing up for their own education. And I think this was this action of the teachers built on that, saying we're also going to take action to defend public education. Yeah, see, I think that that history really is the key. So it's not like this moment, this, this movement came out of nowhere. And that's, I think that's a, that that really tells a lot. Just as Rosa Parks' action didn't come out of nowhere, they'd been organizing for years. Thanks. Right. Anybody else with a quick quick question for Jesse before he has to go? I want to respect that. But other questions or thoughts? 
I, I had a question about Unity. Um, and when I heard when I heard about this story in January, I was worried because it seemed that there were correct me if I'm wrong, but you got you got um, unanimity unanimity in the vote because you brought together teachers who were against testing altogether and teachers who were against this particular test. And it sounded like the district was going to come to those teachers who were against this particular test and say, we have a better test. And then that would split you off. I mean, was it was it important that you were unified in this? Um, and is that sort of analysis of, of how it worked, how you saw it too? Yeah, I think it was really important that we had a unanimous vote and that the entire school was invested in this and for that reason I think it was right to target this specific test and get everyone on board because not everyone at Garfield's against standardized testing in general mm -hmm. uh, but everyone knew that this test in particular was deeply flawed and I think through the process of the struggle against the MAP test, we've been able to educate a lot of the teachers about what's wrong with standardized testing in general, but not setting the bar impossibly high from the beginning of the struggle was, I think, crucial uh, to our victory against this test and to helping inspire people around the country and educate people around the country as to what's wrong with standardized testing and we actually formed a committee to talk about what will replace the MAP test and I'll send that out from my website if you um, sign up to follow my website we have a um, a document that teachers have been working on for weeks about what guidelines we think should be followed for any exam or any assessment that replaces the MAP test and I think um, people will find it very useful in moving away from standardized testing. Cool. I really want to respect your time and, and invite you back um, so that you'll know we'll respect that when we can. Um, can, um, can you say your website again? What's the URL for that? It's IamAnEducator.com. Cool. So thank you so much. We want to, unless you have others, if you can stay, do, but you said you needed to go, so. Yeah, I, sh I should run, but I really appreciate the opportunity, and I look forward to talking to you all later. Thank Big you. Big fan, Jesse. Big fan. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, so. All right, so who wants to jump in on, on this? <laughs> And how you're, what you're thinking about. Mary Beth, why don't you keep talking? Why are you a big fan? Thank you for coming back to TTC. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I went, to, I participated in uh, the United Opt Out um, event that happened in Washington, D.C., uh, I think it was last month. And we camped out in front of the Department of Education for a couple of days. And I was uh, talking to Michelle Gunderson, who works in the Chicago Public School System. And she was talking about how they were able to get so many teachers to vote for uh, in favor of striking earlier in the year, especially when Jonah Edelman et al. had, in fact, worked to raise the bar for the requirement for how many teachers it took to um, gather enough people to strike. And, you know, it was a tremendous percentage of um, teachers that they needed to walk out, more than 90%. And they got that vote, and I think that uh, Steve was talking about how do you get unity among your staff. I mean, you get you get two teachers in a room, and you're going to have two different opinions on <laughs> any different topic. You know, we're educated people; we have our own opinions. We're not afraid to voice them, etc. But I think at my end, I've been working at a you know with one or two teachers at a time to try and politicize them so that they see their job more than than just the 24 little faces that sit in front of them on a given day. I think Michelle said something at, at the Department of Education that really got me motivated, which is teaching is a political act. And I've viewed my myself differently ever since I heard her say that. I'm like, yeah, on a daily basis. The things I say in my classroom, the things I stand up for, the things I argue for, Jesse said he was willing to get arrested because he so believed in the cause of education. Now, how do I light that fire in, in my colleagues? And, and I think that 
Michelle was talking about starting small, starting with little things, like just getting all teachers to wear their union t-shirt one day, or she said that one day she and her staff at her school graded papers outside in a park near their school so that the community could see that their hours lasted far longer than eight to three. She said they did a, a food drive where they brought cans of food to school and donated it to the local shelter in their community. And that they did so very publicly as a, as, a, as a school body, as the teachers made it very publicly seen that, look, we're, we're standing here with your community. Not just that we're parking our car and then leaving and going home to our community, but we're here in your community. And so then they started to get parent support, and the students were behind them. So just watching this gradual mo movement um, is inspirational, but I'm trying to replicate it. Are other people having more success where they are replicating it? Mm. You don't feel success where you are? Um, you know, I, I, got, I got one person to go with me to D.C., <laughs> and there's an Albany March coming up in June, and I've got four people going to that. So, yes, I mean, if you're looking at the division of cells, yes, I'm getting the cells to divide, <laughs> and more and more people are participating. But if this is how cellular division goes, then my organism is going to die because we need to we need to replicate a lot quicker. I say, can I can I throw it to you um, as another New York educator um, uh, with us? How, how is um, the work you do connected to this sort of collective collective action that Mary Mary Beth has been describing? If that's a fair question. Wow. Well, um, <laughs> I seem to be working within a bunch of different spaces and um, what I mean by that is this um, most of my work seems to be uh, either in uh, online spaces or more national forums versus New York City I mean lately I've been getting more involved with the New York City scene but I gotta say I've, I've been very privileged to be um, in different spaces working with different folks around um, teacher advocacy uh, trying to get teacher voice and trying to define what that looks like and hopefully redefine what that looks like too. Can, um, you, can, can you name a couple of those places for us? Well, um, I've been part of the Center for Teaching Quality, which I'm sure a lot of people have, well, some people may have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot of great work with teacher leaders, but um, I've also been in some spaces that aren't, aren't always as friendly to teachers. Um, I've been in a couple of different conferences with the Common Core folk, the people who created them, and I've uh, had my own commentary about what they define as teacher voice versus what I define as teacher voice. <laughs> um, they, for example, they'll have like one yeah. PowerPoint slide that's dedicated to them having them just having one teacher who looked at everything and said, oh, well, that seemed to work out um, out of 135 so-called experts. Um, and that that's always fun versus us as educators, not just, you know, teachers, but also principals and everybody else being part of the whole Common Core process. But um, that that's just one big example of some of the things that I've been very fortunate to do. I, I, in, a, in a way, I'm a teacher ombudsman, if you will. Um, I'm sure other people can speak to that as well, but I mean... That, that seems to be my role at this juncture. Jose, I think you're being modest. I follow you on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter. I read your blog. Um, so, you know, you have a very big footprint out there. I, I appreciate that. I, I, you know, I try, to, I try to keep humble, too, because I think a lot of that, too, stems from me trying to be the best teacher possible. Um, there's been a, a weird movement lately of a couple of people forgetting the word teacher within teacher leader, um, like trying to become the best educator possible um, during, you know, their expedition as, you know, a, an actual teacher leader or a teacher activist or a teacher promoter, um, whatever have you. Um, there's that expertise that's very necessary for our students to do well. And we need to keep that in mind as we're doing all the things that we're doing on the outside as well. So I, I try to keep modest. So thank you for that. Let's stay with you a little bit, Jose. Would you be willing to join a uh, testing protest? I'm sorry, what? Would you be willing to join a protest or boycott of testing? 
Um, of course. Now, this is also this is also worth saying. Um, at, back in 2009, there was this little thing called the Save Our Schools March, um, which maybe a couple of you have heard. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> 2011, and um, I, I was able to do a couple of things here and there with that, um, advocating against the testing, but also becoming more pro whole child education, which I think is a, a bigger linchpin than just being anti-testing, if you know what I'm trying to Good get point. at. Um, we need to find a way to um, fill in whatever gap it is with actual whole child, you know, goodness and richness and trying to get actual pedagogy within that gap that we choose to, to you know, knock the testing out of. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad to hear you say that, Jose, because um, this is Stephen Zimmerman talking. Yeah, about. It's okay. but, um, because one of the concerns I've had is that I think a fairly large swath of the public doesn't really have a very clear idea of what we do, and so um, if our uh, political actions look mainly uh, to be about protecting our jobs or you know a status quo uh, we, we, we don't we don't get as much public support um, and um, uh, so that if, if we can pair uh, advocacy about policies with you know specifics about you know what makes a good great classroom and what do kids really need I, I think we have a better chance of being being listened to by the wider public, but that's a big job. Of course, of course. So let's stay on that question, and let me uh, try to try to draw Diana into this a little bit. Um, Diana, how how are you a teacher leader? And then here's the question behind it, <laughs> behind that one, um, mm -hmm. which is like, where's the balance between telling the positive story? Um, that or telling whatever the story is we need to tell as teachers and you know resisting the kind of abuse that we feel happens because of testing and maybe other things as well good question so there, <laughs> yeah. I, okay so I've spent the last couple of weeks in Philly I'm, I'm in Wisconsin now I'm a bit nomadic and have been watching things devolve pretty um, categorically um, regarding, they call it the doomsday budget that is about to be passed. There's a huge rally, so I want to like point out what what is going on in the community that I'm still closest to, in terms of what's going on on a day to day basis. And um, and the When's teachers, the rally? there's a, a tomorrow 4:30 um, on the steps of 440, which is the big district building in Philadelphia. And there have been two major student walkouts with thousands of students that have already marched on City Hall in the last couple of weeks. And there is going to be a massive force out tomorrow on the steps of the district building on Broad Street. I, I would be surprised if Broad Street wasn't closed down tomorrow in the middle of Philadelphia at rush hour. Um, and would you could you characterize what the demand is or what the? <laughs> is that so this is how bad the budget. So it's uh, it, we're at. I like to summarize it by saying we're at. Oh no. We love kind of how bad the budget situation is. Like, we're we're mm -hmm. headed to um, basically the budgets that they funded for the schools fund only a principal, no matter how large your building is, and one teacher for every 33 students in the high schools, and one teacher for every 30 students in the elementary and middles. And what that means is no secretaries, no counselors, no nurses, no support staff, no sports, no music, no art, no library, no, no. They call it the doomsday budget. And basically they're in a position where they're so jammed up because they're controlled by the city and the state so they cannot levy their own money. They have to go asking for it. There has been massive mismanagement of dollars in the last several years for a number of reasons. Um, and where we're at right now is in a hole so big we can't dig out and the budget that we can afford doesn't even look like education anymore. It looks like you know, it's it, the jails are better staffed. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of where we're at. And so there's a lot of uh, very fired up parents, students, massive budget shortfalls. Um, 
uh, we we at with the SLA community has been fundraising. Um, Chris Lehman has been putting up a absolutely just a heroic effort to try to backfill our shortfall to keep the program intact, and and has gotten pretty close. It's it's, but many of the schools aren't in a position where they're they're going to do that. So, and the contract is up this summer as well. And their their proposal for the contract is one of the most insulting things I've ever seen levied um, ever by a school district. If you want a good read, I can send that out for you for just how insulting yeah. um, the contract is. So let's try to get back to how do we tell so, positive so stories. That's not that, the but positive side. I know, but let's stay there for a second. <laughs> let's stay. And Steve, Steve, uh, Stephen Zellman, could you describe, there are people in the streets in Chicago, too, for similar reasons, it sounds like. It yeah, um, you know, here by doing it, you know, with a number of schools rather than across the whole district, um, I suppose it's a, it's a strategy on the part of the mayor uh, to try to contain it and not make it quite so doomsday, you know, and... Um, and it, it tends to focus people in each neighborhood on just saving their own school rather than the bigger picture. But so there are a lot of schools being closed down. They, right? Yeah, I think it's 49 or 50. Uh, the number keeps changing a little bit. Yeah, it's still a huge number out of 600 some odd. And uh, also notice they stayed away from closing high schools because I think they knew very well that uh, they've already experienced, you know, high levels of violence and kids being killed uh, when they're suddenly in a school, you know, where they're facing uh, rival gangs. Um, and Steve, I just yeah. wanted to jump in and say that in Philly, they're closing about 10% of the schools as well and, and did yeah. not learn that particular lesson and are really? closing high schools and there are problems. Well, yeah, well, I mean... Part of me feels like people are only going to do something when the pain gets really bad, you know? I mean, it's a terrible thing to say that, that in a case like that, maybe some kids are going to die before people actually stop and, you know, lar in large enough and influential enough numbers to say, what, is, what are we doing? Um, so I, I don't know where it's going here. I mean, the board went ahead and... Uh, you know, okay, the closing of these schools, the unions got some lawsuits going. I think another big, um, it may be kind of quiet till fall when these kids have to start going to the new schools. Um, and uh, so I, I would think that it, it could, you know, it's hard to know. I, I'm not you know, a good enough political expert to be able to tell exactly where it's going to go here because, um, you know, it, it could depend on whether there's real violence and whether some kids really get hurt or killed as a result of all this, you know, because they're going to schools in, in other neighborhoods. Um, I'll be interested to see also, I mean, the union, uh, Karen Lewis is a very in-your-face person. And uh, she's not terribly likable, but she's a really smart organizer. And um, uh, so I'm wondering what this is going to do in terms of the next mayoral election or whether it'll have died down. I, I don't know whether people will remain worked up or whether it'll just kind of fade. So I, I think we're going to have to wait and see what happens in the fall. Uh, Pat, did you want to jump in? I don't. We don't see you, but just want to invite you anytime to jump in if you'd like. Um, I, is my audio working? It is working. Go ahead. There you go. Well, I kind of want to move the conversation a little bit to. I, I see Diana has already responded to me in chat. Go ahead. This whole question of AFT, NEA, NCT, and chat. NEA. And, and, and chats at edtechtalk.com slash TTT, by the way. Go ahead. Well, just how these national, regional organizations relate to these local activities. And my feeling at the moment is that we're being sold out. Um, I'm hoping June 18th, Paul, get, get Ohanian on. <laughs> 
and and maybe uh, Stephen Krashen. I, 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 everybody's doing great work locally, and at the same time, you know, you get the American Association of Educational Researchers out in San Francisco booing Duncan, and then tons of apologies coming out from online educators. It's sort of like the union captain of the labor ship is asleep at the wheel. <laughs> I don't want to be a downer here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and I, and I read Jose. I, I've been following, as Paul said, you know, I was blogging in 1999. I, I have never stopped watching what's out there in terms of um, well-educated critically conscious educators talking about what's happening to the big picture. And th that level of conversation is phenomenal. It, it's, it's articulate. It is, it's rooted in classroom practice. It's, it's really what the, what, what the Bay Area Writing Project was when it began, this whole notion that teachers know what's best. And the problem is that we haven't empowered them to talk to each other. Well, that's what unions are about, and I'm, I got to tell you, I'm just shocked at, at the caving in. Uh, sorry. <laughs> where, where, where do you see the caving in? Okay, what do you mean? Where, where do I see the caving in? Um, so this whole thing of Common Core state standards, in, 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 let, let's just take Common Core. Mm -hmm. In California and San Francisco in particular, Common Core is coming in with Smarter Balance Consortium testing in 2014. And there is absolutely no way that that assessment, supposedly computer-based, but it's not going to be, computer-adapted, but it's not going to be, because we don't have the infrastructure for it. There is absolutely no way that the resources necessary to train teachers now, I'm, for the moment, I'm saying, go ahead, train teachers. Okay, Common Core, I don't give a crap. It's no different than the California Assessment Program or the California Learning Assessment System. All of that stuff, which was defunded by the right wing in California in, in the 90s, it's all coming back now, and, it, and some of the stuff is really good. But there is no money, time, or resource to train teachers to do this. And they're going to be faulted for having failed to do it in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And the unions are not saying a goddamn word about it. They're all saying, oh, yeah, Common Core, that's, that's wonderful. What's, what's Randy's latest thing? Switch or what? <laughs> something about, something about uh, yes, yes, we'll go ahead with Common Core, but the last thing that we need to do is um, make the assessment happen too soon. She wants a moratorium on uh, all the high stakes right. of ra right. ramifications associated with it. And I think what she's hoping for there is that they're just going to defund it. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So we have we have about ten minutes left. Um, who wants to jump in with where you think we should go in these ten minutes? Thank you, Pat, for not. Well, well, uh, well how about you should go on June eighteenth? Well, mm. yeah. What? Well, let's get back to the positive. How in in this big picture that has been uh, laid out pretty pretty depressingly <laughs> here? Um, how do we how do we keep telling? Uh, the I can jump in. Story. Yeah, good. Yeah, Thanks. I have a suggestion too. Okay, so just quickly, uh, I, I I've had the 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 really uh, so I've been taking the year and I've done a lot of different things. I was 15 years in the classroom and now I've spent a year, as several of my close friends like to say, wandering around doing little of nothing. However, I have been doing a lot of different work in a lot of different places in the country. And what while there is this. I mean, constant grind and kind of great of this this thing that's very political next to what's happening. Teachers are still really excited about what's happening in their classroom with kids, are still yes. doing right by their kids, are still yes. doing all of this amazing work. 
And one of the things that I think we still have, I mean, other than what has been talked about for, you know, what kind of advocacy we can do, we still have the potential to just inundate the local communities with such positive, wonderful stories about what is happening with teachers and kids and learning in spaces that on a local level, you can still have a lot of work. I know a lot of what we're talking about today is, um, is urban-based, but a, a good chunk of America isn't urban, and it is still... I mean, I, the community I grew up in that I'm sitting in right now is 454 people in my hometown, and my brother-in-law is the superintendent of the tiny little district up here, and they're facing a lot of troubles and problems as well, but one of the things that they found most effective is, is continually showing off what is working, going out as much as possible into the community, inviting the community in, really trying to convince everybody that it is everybody's best interest to move this thing forward. There will always be these outside forces, and we can deal with that as well. But the simultaneous thing that needs to keep occurring is that you know we continue to show off why funding, why support is really important, and what the learning looks like when we focus on something other than just the test. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say something about that, because that's why I started TeachersSpeakUp.com. That's what I've really focused on, and I've, I've tried... I've, been able to feature things that do that, like um, Peter Smagorinsky's portraits of great teachers that are then published in the Atlanta Journal Constitution periodically, and then they feature the the TV station there has a weekly feature of a, of a great teacher, and I think those things are really important. But I gotta say that the frustrating thing that I've experienced, and I don't, I haven't figured out the answer to on TeachersSpeakUp.com is people read it, they tell me, oh, they love it, this is great, you're doing such good stuff, but I don't see um, my effort leading to many more teachers actually telling those stories publicly. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know where to go with that. The, the one example that I, the examples that I see of teachers speaking out is when their backs are to the wall. It just hit me over the head when New York had this new ELA, uh, you know, state exam and kids were crying and throwing up in the classroom and when Lucy Calkins uh, set up a, a, this ELAfeedback.com site, hundreds of teachers wrote to that, which is great. Um, but it's sort of like everybody has to be you know, at almost a death's doorstop before they finally, you know, speak up. And I wish I knew what to do about that because I agree that the good stories are out there and help, but I don't know how to get more of them out. And it's been hard to get the newspapers to pay attention and to publish them, even when I have a few. So that's been frustrating. Um, the one thing that I would add is that I think that Jesse Hagopian's story, what it's about is classic organizing with all the really classic principles that organizers have used over the decades that got those teachers together to the point where they could both resist and be positive too. And it took several years of history of work doing that. It, was, it didn't come out of nowhere. And he, he outlined very clearly all the steps that he took in the hard work it took to get to that point. And can, can, uh, that, can that's you, what can, organizers say is the way you got to go. Can you once again list uh, a few of those points, Stephen, well, that you heard? Yeah, I mean, as I was listening, because I, I really, I had this period a few years ago where I was working with an organizer on an education project here, and it was like learning a whole new vocabulary and, you know, and, and a way of thinking about change in institutions and communities. And I could just tick off the things. So, yeah, I mean, he, he, he started using the, the, um, the union meetings as discussion places and involving lots of teachers so a lot of people felt like their voices were being heard and that went on he explained over a period of time so that that became this kind of forum this kind of place that people knew that they could go um, I think that another interesting factor, and it reminded me of Birmingham, where I just was last month, you know, the Children's March. The parents were afraid to get out there, but the kids marched, thousands of kids, and that was, that was tremendously powerful and inspiring uh, in Birmingham. And um, 
uh, because the kids felt they had less to lose. Um, but those kids had been had been organized for months and months themselves. It's really a fascinating story, and um, so a lot of listening, a lot of um, educating, uh, you know, bringing the the different departments together, having small victories. There were a number of small victories that happened first, and when you get small victories, then that uh, emboldens people to take the risk for more. Um, and figuring out the leverage by which you get to the point where people feel like they don't have much left to lose. When he said that, you know, that one teacher stood up and said, I'm going to be labeled a failure anyway, so what the hell's the difference? You know, let me stand up for what I believe. Um, that's, and, and when you have meetings like that, you know, an organizer would say, you don't do this alone. You make sure you have what organizers call a floor, uh, or what do they call it, um, allies uh, on the floor who are going to stand up and with strong voices kind of second what you're saying and then that carries a lot of other people along with you. It's very intentional and very organized and smart. That's what Cesar Chavez That's, did. Yeah, that, that, thank you for that. <laughs> for that no little lesson. I mean it's late in the day, the evening and so yeah. I could so I could no, email right. you know a list of, of some of these I, items, some of these strategies that organizers use. And, um, as and by the way, Kathy yeah. Kathy Fleischer did a book on this that never sold very much. Where the hell is it? It's somewhere in the piles by my desk. I don't. Is it I in can... your bibliography on the site? Or um, put it there. I think I mentioned there. I mentioned <laughs> it there. I forget. But if people, it's a great bibliography. Got yeah. com, and it's a book about teachers as organizers, and it it outlines it because her husband is one. So I'm still curious as as we're ending here, and I'm wondering if others might reflect on this or whatever you want to. But here's what I uh, just uh, as as kind of last word. Um, it seems to me like there's telling the positive stories in your local place, um, and, and I kind of like that notion. And then this organizing um, aren't necessarily connected, but are more powerful when they are. But I'm just interested to think about what what that's about. Um, and so that's so it feels to me like there are different pieces of leadership and raising your voice and and organizing with peers and so forth and and those pieces need to come together yes. um, but Mary Beth do you have any kind of final thoughts as well I, I was intrigued by something Jose said when he was talking about when we're talking about <laughs> teacher leaders that um, that being a teacher and being a master of your craft is an important aspect of this and mm -hmm. that a lot of times I think the the master teachers need to step up and let their voices be heard because they're often not the ones who complain or come forward and I, I think that's why I got so much attention because I was listed as highly effective which I knew long before any test scores came out. You know, I know the day I, I step into my classroom, who's in charge and how's it going to work and all the excellence that my students are going to produce and, and people want to be in my classroom, etc. But when I started speaking out and my colleagues were like, wow, you know, she's saying something? She's... Da -da. Yeah, because I know what it is to be an educator. And I am advocating not just to have an easier work day. That is not what I'm looking for. I am looking to be honored as a professional. And so I'm finding it interesting, this place where there's this balance between my development as a professional, notice I didn't say professional development, my development as a professional balanced against, you know, uh, my political activities. And they're not against each other. These things are not butting heads. These things walk side by side. And, and I think a lot of times people see the union as a bastion for weak teachers. And maybe that's been what it's been in the past, and that could be what it's going to be in the future. But I see it as, and, and it's starting low, because the um, social media has democratized so much. I don't even think we know exactly its full power yet. Certainly so many teachers aren't even... Uh, there are teachers who couldn't do what we're doing right now. They don't know how to use this equipment. They don't know how to sure. Twitter. They don't know. They don't know any of this stuff. But this democratization holds a lot of potential to be 
a workaround, a, a lazy union, or a bought and paid for union, as I mentioned in the group chat. And, and I think if, if we can get more excellent teachers, teachers who are highly um, respected by their colleagues, to come into forums like this and to speak, then, then we've got something going. So that, I, I mean, Jesse's gone now, but, you know, he's a union leader. Right. And, and I'd love to, for him to have been here for me to say, who was that teacher who said, I got nothing to lose? Was that one of your best teachers? Or was that one of the teachers you're like, damn, when's that person retiring? You know, like, I bet that was a great teacher. And that's when everybody was like, damn, that teacher, I, I'm, I'd put money on it. And so we're, we, need more, uh, we need more excellence out there saying, this is not right. This is not the type of education I want for my child. Why is it okay for all these black and brown kids? This is wrong. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Jose, do you want to have uh, final reflections here? I think I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of conversation around um, the local pieces and the national pieces. Um, there's a lot of discussion of the lay of the land. Um, one thing that I probably want to just touch upon is the idea that as teachers, when we use our voices, we need to find ways in which we can do it so we can talk about both. In other words, being able to talk about the things that happen within the classroom and how they affect what happened outside the classroom. What often happens is um, policymakers make their policy, then it trickles down to whatever central local district, um, and then they start crafting up a bunch of things, and then that comes to the principal, which turns into whatever, um, and we become the, the second to the bottom as far as um, anything concerning the classroom is concerned and I, I really want to change that paradigm such that practitioners are at the center with uh, children really being in our ears as often as possible um, and in order for that to happen we speak up a little bit more being able to talk about what happens and and a more uh, being a little bit more thorough in the way we think about classroom practice and pedagogy and policy I mean that's really where I'm at and so long as we could keep having the conversations um, I think that's where we can really start, you know, finding the the common common ground on things. Uh, more than anything else, I mean, I've been in conversations with again a bunch of different people, um, and I disagreed with a lot of people very profusely. Um, <laughs> but the one thing I always find is um, if I can get my point across, I start getting wheels turning around the things that we as teachers really need to get at. We as uh, you know, educators as a whole. Um, how do we change that conversation? Not just in protest. Obviously, you know, protest is a, a really awesome way to go. Um, but then, what what else do we do on top of that? How do we get the conversation started without looking like a bunch of complainers? Hmm. I was impressed that in Seattle, they're both still working with the K to eight teachers in a in a political way, and they have to. They're, they're coming up with alternative assessments as well. So there's both this positive thing going on and this sort of political thing happening at the same time, which is really interesting. Um, Paul, I, yeah, go Paul, ahead. can I just jump in real quick? Um, yes, building off of what Jose said, this reminded me, um, one thing we can all do is wherever we're finding ourselves in organizations or sitting in front of panels or invited to be at things or to sit in an audience um, for different events, um, I constantly comb who is speaking, whether or not they've been in a classroom recently, um, and, and if there's kids invited. And we can, we can improve some of these conversations also by continually challenging the organizations that we belong to, the conferences that we attend, and all the events by where are the classroom teachers, because it gets at what Jose was saying, you know, second to the bottom, and then the, theoretically the kids are the bottom. How do we flip that around to get them on the stage, to get their voices heard, to, to invite them into the conversation? Um, two and a half years ago, I saw a list for a very big thing happening in New York, and there wasn't there wasn't a teacher on the list out of 65 different people they were going to put on stage, and it was all about the next generation of teaching and learning, and it was comical to me, but they knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't invite teachers on purpose, and it was insulting, and so we just need to keep challenging that, that uh, kind of 
momentum that says you're there to be talked to and talked at and take orders and instead of being invited to the table as a professional. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop anybody else from jumping in because we're <laughs> going. Um, but thank you all. Um, let me just um, say that we meet here every Wednesday night um, at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Next week, um, James Paul G is going to be with us, so you have a homework assignment, which is to read the anti-education era, um, uh, and uh, so you can have a conversation with him about that book. Um, after that, we're going to be talking to the folks from Guru, and then we're going to have this conversation about raising teacher voice again, and hopefully, Catherine Shulton from the uh, Learning Time, the Learning Blog uh, Lear uh, at the New York Times, um, will be with us as, as well as some others, and hopefully, some of you will come back for that continuing conversation. So, we've got some uh, exciting things planned in June. Uh, we do this over the um, EdTech Talk. Uh, channel of the World Bridges Network, and uh, the leaders who helped make that happen were Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier, and we always thank them here at the end of this. Thank you all, and um, this will be up at uh, teacherseekingteachers.org and at edtechtalk.com, and uh, within a half an hour it goes up on the YouTube channel too, so you can uh, check it up there pretty fast. Thank you all, and good Thanks night. Paul. Good night. <laughs>